afternoon and welcome to another edition of Inside Government, a program designed to bring to you the people information related to government policies and decisions. We are in the budget period, a very exciting period for many, and many of us too are very anxious as the government continues to outline its plans for the 2014-2015 fiscal year. This afternoon, my guest is Prime Minister and Minister for Finance, Economic Affairs, Planning and Social Security, Honorable Dr. Kennedy Anthony, your very first time on this program with me. I want to give you a very special welcome and thank you for being on with me this afternoon. Well, thank you so much, J.D., for inviting me to your program. You're right. It's the first time that I'm joining you on a program here. Every Wednesday night, we are down south in yes. Newport on Love FM. Yes. And uh, we have a Wednesday night program, so this is a very unique opportunity. I want to thank you. I know that there are a lot of questions in the minds of our listeners. Yes. And it's a wonderful opportunity to be able to address some of the questions that they have. So thank you for having me here. I just want to put you on notice that we may very well be doing the same thing the next time you're on our program in View Fort because we have been getting <laughs> a lot of yes. calls and questions, questions as it relates yes. to the economy and, and the budget. Right. But before yeah. we continue, I just sure. want to let our listeners know that you can call someone, let them know that the program is on. We are streaming mm. live online, www.rslonline.com. You can send in your questions via email, live at rslonline.com. And the digital texting platform is 973. Later on, we'll field your questions at 452-3959. But now is the time to get into the discussion with our Prime Minister, Dr. Anthony, the economy. This word has been on the lips of almost every St. Lucian. Many persons are asking questions. How mm -hmm. did we get here? Where are we? And how will we get out of the situation right, right. that we are now facing? Last week, you brought to the House of Assembly the estimate of revenue and expenditure for 2014-2015. Mm -hmm. When you presented the summary of the estimates, you spoke of some of the modest gains that we've made over the last mm -hmm. year. Mm -hmm. But you also outlined a picture that send the message that there needs to be immediate action to deal with the problems that we're facing. I want to start by getting some background information as to how the economy performed over the last year. Mm -hmm. um, where were we? I know that we set out some goals in the last budget, and how did we fare in terms of dealing with that big problem that you outlined in the last budget, mm -hmm. which was a fiscal deficit? Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a word you use, and I don't want us to lose sight at all. We made some progress last year. It's very important that that be on the score. But let's do a general review of the economy to see where we are. Yes. There's that big word, fiscal deficit. And translated, it just simply means that we are spending far more than we are earning. And we spend when we pay what you call a recurrent um, expenditure, like your civil servants, the salaries, the wages, the services, the things we buy for the hospitals, for example. And then we also spend what you call capital, that is to say, um, the money that we spend on new investment. If you're going to put, for example, um, new pipelines to uh, transmit water, you're going to build new roads, new bridges, new schools. These, these are all capital expenditure on the capital expenditure side. The economy, the first thing to note is that we had a deficit, or we started the commencement of the year with a deficit about 9.6% of GDP. Now, GDP is the total value of all the goods and services you produced in the country and you measure it uh, um, in terms of your GDP. So we had a huge deficit, 9.6% of that. Basically, again, to repeat what I said, the situation that arises when you are unable um, to raise enough money to pay all your bills, all the, your services. So we have a big deficit. The good thing is that we were able to reduce that deficit from 9.6% to 5.8%. Now, that's remarkable because um, you don't normally achieve that unless you are under some kind of program with the IMF. So it's an indication that we had a lot of discipline in, in, in the past year. But overall, the economy did not grow last year. In fact, it slipped into what we call negative growth, meaning that instead of going forward, we went backwards. And there are some reasons for that. First, we did well in tourism. We had an overall of 5% growth in tourism. Um, we didn't do too badly in agriculture. Um, agriculture stabilized, the growth was very, very modest. Um, we didn't do too badly with business services. Amazingly, that grew about 3%, but I suspect mainly in small businesses. Then you had big negatives. Construction was a big one. Um, there was a negative growth rate, about 11%. Manufacturing was another. Um, there was a slight um, a drop in the growth rate, 4.2%. 
for manufacture, and that's not very difficult to understand. Our manufacturing sector relies to some extent on what we sell domestically, but most importantly, what you sell outside of St. Lucia, what you sell, for example, in CARICOM, what you sell, for example, in the UK, and we did not do well because, to use the, the language of the economists, demand was relatively flat in CARICOM, so we did not experience any significant increase. Um, the banks obviously took a beating, um, not just the banks in St. Lucia, but the banks throughout the region. Um, you had, um, I think there's only really one bank here that earned any significant profit. So, But liquidity in the banking system remained pretty high. By liquidity, we mean the actual liquid cash that the banks have um, for on lending, etc. That remained fairly good. But of course, they're telling you they could not find bankable, bankable projects. So basically, um, liquidity is good, but um, at the moment, the banks are not really lending people as much money as possible. Unemployment continues to be a big problem. Yes. Um, we had, when we got into office, we probably inherited about a 24% unemployment rate. It's fluctuated a little bit between 22% and 24 I suspect mainly because of the government's investment in STEP and in NICE. But um, at the last quarter last year, last quarter, December 2013, it slipped to about 22% of the, of the labor force. So that is your overall picture of the situation. Now, you spoke about um, the fiscal deficit and mm -hmm. that we're able to reduce it by such a, a large amount. And you spoke to, um, given the economic environment, that it is indeed a reflection of, of, of discipline and management. Mm. Right. There are some who argue that um, if you are able to reduce the fiscal deficit, the basic explanation is that we're spending more than we're making. Right. The government introduced the VAT, and mm -hmm. so it was able to broaden the tax base. Mm -hmm. And some are saying, well, the reason we have now been able to reduce that deficit is because the government is taxing the public to death, for want of a better <laughs> expression. Right. What is um, the relation in terms of the movement of the government's revenue versus expenditure? I know that in the last budget, there were some significant cuts on the capital side, right. because this is right. where the government had the flexibility. Right. Mm. The reduction we see in the fiscal deficit, is that um, reduction in capital expenditure reflection in there, or do we have um, the broadening of the tax base to thank for that movement as That's well? That's a really good question, really a very good question. Um, and I think I'm going to come to the heart of it. The question is, well, if your fiscal deficit reduced to 5.8%, why do you have a problem? The reality is you still have a problem because you have a deficit of 5.8%, and we are talking about 5.8% of GDP. So you're talking about a fiscal deficit of several million dollars, um, right. a couple hundred million dollars. Um, it means, therefore, that you are still not earning enough to cover that, that amount. That's the first thing. The second thing is this, and this is really very important for people to understand because it touches on another problem that we can talk about later. You know, in the past, we have always had deficits. Yes. Not very high, like 5.8, 6.8, 6.5, 9%, 8%. But we have had. And what we have done is to borrow money to finance the deficits. Because as I've explained, we can understand the concept of a deficit very simply. If you are um, part of a household, that is a husband and wife, you have total bills of $4,000 a month, but a combined salary is 3000 Then you have a deficit of $1 million, And you have to find that $1 million somewhere. It's either you go and borrow that $1 million, or alternatively, you cut down on your expenses so that you don't have that $1 million. You might decide to do away with your mobile phones, do away with subscription TV, um, with, with Lime or whatever the case is, do yeah. away with um, um, your program on choice or whatever the case is. So you make adjustments. Yes. So the reality is that we have handled those deficits by borrowing significant sums of money over the years. And I'm not here to cast blame on this, this, this the former government. I think it's a blame that both parties share because both parties have, in fact, been borrowing to keep this economy going. But something happened. Something happened that made the situation different. And it is the first time St. Lucia has experienced this. This time around, we could not borrow to finance the deficit. That is the crux of your problem. St. Lucia could have gone along its merry way for the next couple of years very easily 
if it could borrow money to pay for the deficit. It would have put us in more trouble down the road. Down the road, yes, later on. And, and certainly we would have collapsed, but we would have bought time. But we can't now because, generally speaking, institutions in the region are unwilling to lend governments. And let me just ex give you an example of, of, of what I'm getting at. A lot of people have heard of something called bonds. And we normally finance um, the deficit or obtain money for development purposes by issuing bonds. These are really paper instruments that say to those who take those bonds, look, at the end, if you lend us $10 million, at the end of 10 years, we're going to give you the $10 million back plus an annual um, interest rate of, let us say, 10% or 5%. So if you lend us... Um, <laughs> Um, 100 million, then you get 10 million in, in profits or whatever the case might be. Are you with me? Yes. Now, last year, and this is where the crux of the problem is, we wanted to issue bonds of $266.5 million. But we actually were able to raise only $45.5 million. That's a significant difference. In other words, we were not able to raise $221 million. Likewise, we wanted to raise short-term loans of 38.9 million, but we were only able to raise 29.3 million. Again, a shortfall of 9.6 million. So what has happened here is that we cannot turn to borrowing to fix up our deficit because banks, individuals, and institutions who used to lend before are no longer lending governments. They're insisting that they will lend you if you get your financial house in order. And in our case, getting our financial house in order means that we have to bring down that fiscal deficit from where it is at 5.8%, below 4%. That's the key. There have been a lot of suggestions, Prime Minister, as to the approach to reducing that fiscal deficit. I know that you begun a process of consultation with uh, members of the private sector from different agencies sometime last year to speak about the economy, to speak about the need to make certain adjustments, to look at the situation and see how government can approach um, this situation in an effort to reduce the fiscal deficit, in an effort to make the, the economy more productive. And um, a number of suggestions came out of mm. that consultation. In an interview with HTS earlier this year, you did indicate that you would be considering some of the suggestions that were put forward. And one of the examples was to look at and review the list of exempt items on, on um, under the Value Added Tax Act. Mm -hmm. Now, many persons see these are alternatives we can welcome. These okay. are alternatives mm -hmm. that, that they see as not having a direct impact on the individual, on the household, and on different sectors of the economy. Now, I know that you have received numerous approaches, and um, the government has to look at the, the, the wider picture because we're dealing with millions of dollars in deficit. But what do you see as the approach, given that um, you have indicated that there is not much flexibility left on the capital side, mm. that we need to We have to stripped look at capital, because yes. capital is here just about... Uh, for all practical purposes, about 129 million. Mm -hmm. What exactly would be the approach to dealing with this situation? Because we have established that there needs to be action, mm -hmm. not um, out of choice, but we are at the point where there is no other thing to do than to look internally. Okay. Just before I, I comment on Nigeria, I want to return to a point you made earlier on. A lot of people say, well, you have VAT, you have raised so much money by VAT. You have to be careful. Um, the truth of the matter is, yes, there was an increase of revenue intake from VAT. We didn't do very badly with revenue this year. As a matter of fact, if you listen to me in the House, you would have heard me say that revenue stabilized, yes. meaning that revenue did not continue to fall. Where there has been a growth in revenue intake from VAT has largely been in respect of the domestic services, for example, professional services, etc., that there has been a growth because the idea behind that was to make sure that everybody um, contributed to taxation. And so that was a great leveler, made sure it touched everybody so that they can contribute to um, revenue intake and don't get away as happened under the old system. So there has been an increase, but the increase in the, take, in the intake from VAT is not enough to meet all our commitments. 
Let's go back to basics. What are these commitments? Our commitments are salaries and wages to public officers yes. and to those employed by the government. The second um, set of commitments have to do with the cost of services, meaning we have education, we have to pay millions of dollars every year. We have health, we have to pay millions of dollars for health. We have to buy medicines to stock um, the, the, the hospitals. Then, of course, apart from all of those, you have to spend to repair um, your roads, and critically and crucially, because you have borrowed in the past Every year, you have to pay huge amounts of interest. interest. And then the big problem comes when you then have to go and pay debt completely. In other words, some loans mature in the course of the year. Um, loans may be 30 million, 40 million. You have to make sure that you are able to meet those loans when they, they come up. So all of this has to be factored in your overall expenditure. There is no way that the amount of VAT we have collected can conceivably um, meet all those expenses. Now, let's come back to the question you raised. The answer is that the consultations have been very helpful. We had this conversation with all the social partners in January. They made some, just, some suggestions. And yes, you're correct. The private sector has been adamant that the government of St. Lucia has too much of a long, exempt list of items. Um, but there's a technical reason why they don't like the long list of exempt items. It is this, that with the exempt items, they can't um, claim what you call input VAT. In other words, the initial VAT expenses they have had up front to acquire the, to acquire the items and put the items to sale, let us say, on their supermarket shelves. And the inevitable cost that may occur, for example, cost of electricity, rental, etc. So the private sector has been opposed to this and have been insisting that we try to reduce this because they're experiencing difficulty. The retreat we had supported the private sector, and this time around, the government is going to reduce the list of exempt items. I think I've spoken to that before. Yes. But the revenue that you're going to get from reducing the exempt islands is nowhere close to what you need. To deal with the problem that St. Lucia has, we need to raise, or rather, we need to reduce expenditure by about $75 million this year. And that is a tall order, an absolutely tall order to be able to, to reduce that. Now, what are the options we have? If you have a fiscal deficit and you need to deal with it, there are several things you can do. One, you can increase taxation. Secondly, um, you, you increase taxation to get additional revenue. Or secondly, you reduce on on revenue. Um, sorry, an you re you reduce an expenditure. Yes. Um, you contain your your expenditure. Um, now, the truth of the matter is, I do not believe that we should introduce new taxes in Solution. I don't think so. Um, for one thing, the economy is still soft. It is taking some time before it settles. And I believe that we are beginning to reach our threshold in taxation. Although we may be still lower than the other islands, but I have to give St. Lucians credit for something that is very important. St. Lucians tend to pay their taxes. And that is something good and positive um, about, ab about citizens of this country. They honor their taxes, and that certainly is a very welcome thing. But I do not believe that we should resolve our issue by way of um, additional taxation to increase revenue. I don't think that is the way to go because it's only going to affect the economy even further. It's going to retard the economy. It's going to limit growth. It's going to limit consumption. And we don't want that to happen. My own view is that we need to make some adjustments within existing taxation, including, of course, reducing the cost of government. Prime Minister, um, yesterday, the Office of the Prime Minister released some information as it relates to the performance of the economy. And in that document, we see that the bulk of government spending has to do with salaries and, and wages, but we also have to deal with interest payments, mm -hmm. which goes back to the problem that you highlighted earlier. Absolutely. That is one of borrowing. Yes. When you presented the estimates in the House of Assembly, you proposed um, that the government of St. Lucia would seek to deal with that problem 
of borrowing because we've reached a point now where it is extremely difficult for us to meet the interest rate and for us to honor the loans that mm. are becoming due. And you indicated that one of the ways um, a government can deal with that situation to introduce a measure of discipline and good management is to establish a debt ceiling. And you indicated that you uh, your government is thinking of going the way of introducing legislation to deal with that. Do you think that this type of measure would deal with the situation we are facing right now, as opposed to looking at our expenditure, that we can look at the other options, go around it and see how we can implement measures mm -hmm. that would, for want of a better word, force any government to act in a manner um, that would cause them to protect the finances mm -hmm. of the country mm -hmm. because we usually do not see um, the implications of decisions that we make now. It's later down the road we get to that yeah. point. So do you think this yeah. would deal with the situation no, as it relates answer, to... The answer is no, Julia. I think the legislation we are talking about is something for the future. The future. But you have invited a question that gives me just a simple little point of departure. Let me just say to all our listeners that generally speaking while our debt to GDP ratio is high it's not higher than the other islands of the Eastern Caribbean our debt to GDP ratio stands at about 74% of GDP yes. not as some suggested 89% that is very wrong um, as we have demonstrated it stands at 74% so at 74% in theory you can have room to borrow. Yes. But that's not the problem. The problem is that you're now in a fiscal crisis, in a fiscal crunch, and institutions don't want to lend. So while you can borrow, no one wants to lend you. Mm -hmm. And this is not something that is just affecting St. Lucia. It has affected all the islands of the Eastern Caribbean. Why? First, Antigua had to undergo an IMF program a couple of years ago. They emerged out of it but the economy in Antigua is exceedingly weak. St. Kitts Nevis had a huge problem. They introduced an IMF program. And the result of that IMF program was that they had to engage in restructuring their debt. They did what you call haircuts. And basically what a haircut means is that they will only pay you part of what they owe you, and you'll have to forego the rest. So if, for example, you invested $50 million in St. Kitts Nevis, the government they will tell you, all right, you invested 50 million, you're entitled to 10 million in, in interest, we're only going to give you 30 million of that. That's what you mean by, by a haircut. Grenada now is in the middle of a major restructuring like us. And Grenada is attempting to develop a home bro program. And at the moment, they have introduced a, a sleuth of new measures to deal with their situation, including, of course, the increase and increase in, in income tax and bringing people into the tax next, which they never had before. So that is happening in Grenada. Dominica, as we know, they had undergone an IMF adjustment several years ago. So in a sense, they are in, a bet, in better shape. But a problem that I'm describing affects the entire Eastern Caribbean. Countries like Montserrat, well, Montserrat, as you know, is a British dependency they've had. Um, a volcanic eruption, this population is small, so we can hardly consider them in this scenario. The other, of course, Anguilla. Anguilla is a very small, small little country of six or 7,000 persons. So they're not in that kind of, of league, or they're not within, in the matrix of the kinds of, of problems that we have. There's so the, the real crux of the problem, therefore, is that we have to deal with immediate debt as of now. But the legislation you are talking about is really something for the future. As you speak of what is happening around us, Prime Minister, and um, the, the regional reality has been a topic of discussion all across. We have been seeing and been reading about what has been happening around, uh, around the region. And when many persons analyze the situation from the regional context, they say it is impossible for you not to go to the IMF. And, and so they're saying basically that, yes, we want to deal with the situation this way and we, we may want to go that way, but St. Lucia is too far gone to make these slight adjustments, that there needs to be some kind of external um, in, involvement so that we can get ourselves back on the right path, if it is as bad as the Prime Minister is saying it is. What do you say to that? You keep on mentioning the point 
if it is as bad as the prime minister because this is a public perception yeah. some people say um, the prime minister likes to cry for what two mm-hmm. years he's been saying to us the economy is weak yeah. things are not doing well, as bad well that may be so but i was at least i was very honest with people and i said we had problems and it is not true to say that I'm only now saying so. From the day that we were elected into office, I said we had problems. Yes. And I never hesitated to say that we had problems. So um, I, I have not pretended it to be otherwise. Quite recently, um, you published, I think, on YouTube the presentation that was made to the unions. Yes. And I want to encourage our listeners to look at that presentation so they can see for themselves what the figures are. So they would know mm-hmm. that whatever I'm saying are not manufacturing figures. These are these are the actual figures from the Ministry of Finance which we are sharing with the public at large. Question then is are we too far gone? There's an important lesson in the last year. We showed we had the will. We showed we had the discipline. We did something that many would have not ha- many would not have thought possible. We were able to reduce that deficit without um, causing immeasurable pain to the population. Of course, yes. I know people have their quarrels with VAT and, and the rest of it. But at the same time, we also reduced spending on goods and services. Um, we took the deliberate effort to, st- to reduce spending on those items. So that while, in part, you may say, that the reduction in deficit was due to the fact that we did not borrow as much money to embark on capital expenditure, and there's an element of truth in that. But there are other ways you could have financed a deficit. For example, the governor of could have given out endless work to contractors to do all kinds of jobs throughout the country, but do not pay them immediately and allow payables to rise. You could have done that. That's a way, but we opted not to do that because we did not think it was a, the right thing to do. So. The current situation is that we can deal with it if we have the will, the courage, and the understanding. That is why it is so vital that we get the unions on board with us on this matter. So that collectively, we are the ones taking that decision. I remember many, many, many years ago, um, John Compton, so John Compton saying to the um, public at large that no way um, this economy is not like a hole with two male crabs. There's only one male crab in it, only one, meaning that there's no room for a government for and, an, and an IMF. Yeah. Um, I believe that we need to minimize that possibility by taking care of this economy, having the strength and having the courage to deal with the problems that we have. The main problem that we have is this fiscal deficit. Obviously, we have other challenges. We have to be more competitive. We have to bring in investment. Now, I want to come back, though, Julia, to that point that you raised. What really are the choices facing the government to reduce um, expenditure? I can't cut back on expenditure on hospitals. I can't cut back on expenditure um, for our schools. I can't do that. I can't cut back on expenditure um, to meet the cost of our electricity, etc., the cost of medicines. We can't do all those things. Therefore, the only potential possibility of helping to contain expenditure has to do with reducing expenditure on wages and salaries, because that has been our historical problem. Right now, the government is spending about 53%, 53%, of what it earns on salaries and wages in the public service. That is why it is absolutely vital that we impose the discipline on ourselves and deal with that situation. Prime Minister, let us have a a frank discussion on the issue of wages for a little bit. Um, A lot of- always had frank discussions. Yes, 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 but I I just want to take it to another angle and to place it in the context of what is happening right Um, now in terms um, of the discussion and the estimates. Mm. You have been criticized in some circles for bringing people around the table to discuss something that you have stamped. In other words, people are saying, the prime minister has Mm. made a decision as to how he's going to deal with this deficit. He has already made up his mind that he's going to cut um, salaries. 
And now he is bringing the public sector unions around the table basically to endorse or, or to um, force them into accepting his own way of dealing with the situation. I have heard you respond to the claims that you have mm. legislated a 5% wage cut and so there is nothing nobody can do about it. Of what value is this consultation process? I, you met with the unions last week. There is a follow-up meeting um, on Friday this week, and I know that you are still engaging them. The discussion mm. is still mm. ongoing. Mm. But of what value is this consultation? Will it add anything um, whatsoever to the process, or are we dealing with a signed deal? No, you're not dealing with any signed deal. And I just want to take you back and invite you to look at my posture and that of my cabinet colleagues as a debate on the estimates. The opposition did every conceivable thing to try to say um, that we have legislated a 5%. I didn't reply. My colleagues did, did not reply. About eight to 10 days, I can't remember, possibly two weeks before the debate on the estimates and expenditure. I wrote the public sector unions and invited them to a meeting. That's not the behavior of a government that, that wants to legislate um, salaries. And there is, of course, a total misunderstanding of the parliamentary process itself. What a constitution requires is that we lay the estimates of revenue and expenditure in parliament. Those estimates are not accompanied by a bill. That doesn't happen. What you do is to come to Parliament and say, this is what we expect to earn, this is what we expect to spend. Right? Now, obviously speaking, obviously, when you are preparing estimates and you have to satisfy the requirement of the Constitution, if I had gone past April 30th, I would have acted in violation of the Constitution. So we had to go to Parliament um, to lay the estimates to pave the way for the budget. Now, you are crafting a budget, and I said earlier that we need to reduce our expenditure by 75 million. Nowhere in that budget are you going to see that kind of figure, but you have to present figures in your estimates. So essentially what you are doing is to present indicative figures and those figures that are presented comes nowhere close to what we are required to do. I made it absolutely clear to the unions that we engage in a process. In other words, that we will discuss all the options we have. I invited the unions to make suggestions to the government about reducing expenditure and uh, do not forget that when we are talking of expenditure reduction, I'm not talking about $2 million or $1 $1 million. We're talking about $75, 75 million. million. We need to reduce expenditure by $75 million this year to deal successfully with the deficit that we have. So I, I've invited them. I've made it quite clear. They asked me at the meeting, well, um, what would be the position when the budget comes? I say, when the budget comes, you're not going to have me making any statement that we're going to reduce wages by X percent or Y percent because we're going to wait the outcomes of the discussion. You will hear me say and hear me signaling that we will reduce expenditure. I mean, I've been very consistent with that. I made it clear that we will reduce expenditure. So I'm hoping that we will be able to work with the unions and come to some kind of agreement. My hope and wish is that the government and the unions will enter in what we call a memorandum of understanding with obligations on both sides. What is expected of the government? What is expected of the unions? And this is nothing new because in Jamaica, there is a memorandum of understanding. In fact, in the case of Jamaica, you'll recall that the public servants in Jamaica initially agreed not to take any increase for three years. Yeah. And now they have added a further three years to it. In the case of Barbados, the option there for that government was a retrenchment of 3,000 workers. Um, in the case of Bermuda, a similar thing, that the government of Bermuda entered into an agreement with its unions regarding the reduction of expenditure in the, in the public service. Now, what are the choices that face us in St. Lucia? That's the bottom line. 
That's a question you have to ask. Yes. The scenario. We have heavily reduced capital expenditure. We are relying largely on grants from foreign governments to take us through our capital program. And of course, we, I think we're going to get a major loan from the World Bank to deal with post-trough um, trough. Post disaster. Thanks to the support of the Republic of China on Taiwan, they're going to continue to support um, our capital program by the um, 12 million US that they provide annually to us. But we have reduced capital expenditure to bare bones. You will see some expenditure, for example, on the hospitals because we are borrowing 20 million from the government of the Republic of China, Taiwan, to finance the completion of, of the St. Jude Hospital. So um, you, you're going to see a bare bone capital um, expenditure. The challenge, therefore, remains, as I said, on the recurrent expenditure side, because that is where the real growth is, is taking place. And when we increased um, salaries by 4%, then obviously the increase in expenditure was, again, fairly significant. These are the choices you have. One, you can decide to retrench, send people home. That's the first choice. Second choice you have is that you can um, reduce wages. The third choice you have is to raise your 75 million by additional taxation. Now let's look at the reality. Our unemployment rate is very high. I don't want to send anybody home. I think it's vital that people hold on to their jobs um, and that we do everything in our power not to retrench persons. I do not believe that retrenchment is a solution. Now, you might say to me that, well, why don't you believe retrenchment is a solution? They did it in Barbados, but there are particular reasons why it was done in Barbados, and you can explore that in a minute. The second thing is, throughout this conversation, Jadia, throughout this exchange, I have made a point absolutely that I don't believe we should introduce new taxes. Um, I, th I, I, I think um, that the solutions have settled well with VAT. Um, we need to well allow it to work. Um, and I don't think St. Lucia should be overburdened with taxation at this point. So I do not want to go the route of taxation, although, as I have said, that we have to make adjustments within existing taxation regimes. And we spoke about one a while ago, dealing with yes. the exempt items and resolving the problem with the private sector and also to earn some additional revenue. So we need to do that. Um, the next obvious um, solution, if you knock out retrenchment, if you knock out taxes, um, tax, if you knock out taxes, would be to reduce expenditure. Now, let me just say this: when the governments have to do these things, people often feel that they don't have a heart, they don't have a soul, they're not human. They just like to cause hardship. But this is the most excruciating decision I've ever had to make in my political life. I have had gone through battles. I've been bruised. I've been battered. Neither will I ever forget what, is it, what was done to me over, over this issue with Russia. But I've come to, to live and watch what happened after that. But that's OK. That's OK. That's history. I let it, I let it go by. No politician likes to make himself unloved and unpopular. Do you think I would want to embark on a measure, embark on an approach that would get people to dislike me, to repudiate me, to hate me? But there are times as a leader of a country that you have to speak for the country and deal with the issue for the country. And that's the problem we are in. For years, we went our merry way, borrowing heavily to meet our expenditure. Now it's no longer possible. People are not lending to us because we are engaged in extravagant consumption. The harsh reality is that we are not earning enough revenue from our taxation measures to meet our costs. And therefore, the only immediate solution to our problem is to really engage in reducing the amount of expenditure that we currently 
engaging in respect of our public service. That's really where the issue lies. Prime Minister, on reducing our expenditure as it relates to wages and salaries, some people say, and I, I can single out the president of the CSC for making such a comment, that the Prime Minister brought this problem upon the public service because we said to him, it is okay, we do not want a 4% increase, but he forced it down our throats. And so now he's reclaiming the 4% with a 1% interest rate. And so we are now paying for a decision that the Prime Minister made last year to grant an increase to, to the public service. And on that basis, they believe that any discussion or proposal to reduce wages and salaries is unfair. And there are two, two responses to that. First, when people hear those statements, they have to evaluate those statements to determine whether those responses are genuine and whether those persons making those statements were late converts into accepting that the problem had the country had a problem. You recall when wage negotiations started um, on the last occasion, I pleaded with the public service unions. I begged them, I said, uh, look, we are going into rough waters. Let's settle for a zero, 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 maybe one, but or zero, zero, zero. I was once again attacked. I was accused of disrespect. I was told that I was disrespecting unions and it is even worse because we are a labor government that we are doing that. I'm sure you remember those very colorful um, terms that were used to describe me. Of but course. of course, I, I never responded or, or replied. Um, and, and so I think we have to assess those statements to really determine where that they were well meant, where they were meant in the interest of the country. And it is very interesting that even after the members of the CSA who attended that meeting and voted against uh, the 4%, it was interesting, all of them took the 4% when it was offered. But that's history, and I really don't want to have to, to go there. My Do you think you should have been a little bit tougher, um, given where we are now? Um, no, the answer is no, and, I, and I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Even when the unions accepted the 4%, I think they understood that the writing was on the wall, that we are entering into very challenging waters. But I genuinely believed at the time that we gave the 4% that we would have made um, our way through the difficulties. The reason mm -hmm. was simple, that up until then, we were able to raise loans because even with the payments to the public officers, we had to borrow to do so. And that's the vital difference. That's the point I keep on hammering. The situation that now confronts us is that we can no longer finance those expenses by borrowing. That is why we have to cut our cloth to make sure it fits us. Prime Minister, you are engaging in discussions with not just the unions. Um, mm. You are bringing in members of the media, um, you've also written to the National Youth Council, um, SLISBA, and other such agencies so that you can bring mm. um, these agencies and these groups around the discussion table to explain to them um, where we are right now and to also solicit from them their own views on the way forward. I know that over the last two years, for many of these organizations, this is not the first time you will be meeting them. Um, I have been part of meetings, um, particularly with the NYC, where you've mm. spoken with them and invited them to bring in their suggestions to deal with some of the social issues that we're mm. faced with, as right. well as the economic issues. And so this is not a first time um, meeting for many of these agencies, but it is a meeting with a difference. And you are basically bringing the information to them to solicit from them an understanding and a response as to where we go forward. Yeah. yeah what yeah. do what do you um, hope to achieve out of this consultation? Mm -hmm. Because many persons see it as simply seeking for sympathy, and so <laughs> the prime minister brings them around the table. He discusses with them. He tells them. And so, what next? Okay. Um, I can well understand why people, some people, would suggest that I'm looking for sympathy. 
Um, of course, you do need sympathy in this kind of situation. But it's not sympathy for me. It's sympathy for St. Lucia to understand the depth and the gravity of the problem that we have. This is an issue that touches every single St. Lucian. Um, it touches wage earners. It touches households. It touches mothers, fathers, children. And uh, no one, no one is immune from the um, effects. No one is immune from the consequences. So that's just the second thing. But I believe it is vital that the people of this country n know exactly what the issues are, so they are not misled, and they can make judgments of their own. They need to understand precisely why we have the problem and what the options that we have to deal with the problem. This is not a situation that you can obfuscate, that you can um, hide away, that you can dress up. People need to understand what is happening. Now, I'll tell you this. My impression is that the um, that individuals in the private sector know and understand what's happening. Here. If there is any group that has suffered in this economic crisis, it's been the ordinary workers. Persons who work in construction, persons who work in hotels, persons who work in shops, you name it. Persons who work in manufacturing plants, because they have borne the brunt of it. Many of those persons have lost their jobs because of this crisis. The people at distillers, for example, know full well what it is like not to sell enough of their spirits on the regional market. They know, they understand, because they have felt it. The problem is that within the public sector itself, there has been no obvious adjustment so far. The public service has been relatively immune from adjustment. They have not felt any pain like the people in the, in the private sector. It is therefore vital, absolutely vital, that we all understand what is happening. As I have said in previous statements, I am willing to meet any group that wishes me to meet with them. Um, once, of course, appropriate arrangements are put into place, to ensure that there is a fair exchange of views. And yes, I have invited the Christian Council um, for an opportunity for a meeting, I think on Friday this week. We are meeting uh, members of the media, media, all members of the media, not just the media association. And the intention is um, to brief them on what the issues are. I mean, they can have whatever views that they want or they can propagate whatever views that they want. That's not the point that I want, that, that I'm interested. What I want them to understand are the fundamentals. What is the situation? Why we have to take the measures? And of course, uh, it then becomes a matter of, for them so that they themselves are empowered. They themselves are informed. You're right, I've invited the National Youth Council. Um, I've invited the Small Business Association. And uh, um, I'm just trying to remember who else I've invited so far. But I have indicated that I am willing to meet any group. I mean, we'll be very active in the next few months taking this message to our people. And the other point, too, J.D., is this. It's not a question of looking for sympathy, you know. Um, it's also an opportunity um, to learn. You will be amazed that people do make suggestions. I'm often amused when people say to me, I don't, people say, Kenny Anthony doesn't listen. <laughs> um, he's stubborn. He has his own mind. You know, I mean, I, this morning, and I, I know Chester Hingston will forgive me for saying this. I met him in Parliament this morning, just before the throne speech. And I said to him, did you recognize that one of the ideas that you made to me was embraced by me in the last budget presentation? He looked a little puzzled. And I said, but do you remember when we had a meeting with all the bankers and you were representing the Bank of Nova Scotia, you made a suggestion to me and asked me and told me that I should report to the nation on all your, in the subsequent budget, your previous plans and whether you made progress on those plans. And he said, oh yes, I remember. I said, good. Well, you know, it was done last year where there was a section of the budget we yes. reported on the previous initiatives. And in this budget, we are going to do the same thing. Now, you'll be amazed when you talk to people that they come up with suggestions so that their opinions are, are valuable, um, very needed. But my main concern is 
that people basically understand what we are doing and why we are doing it and why it is necessary at this time. Prime Minister, we are quickly running out of time, but just before we open the phone lines to get some um, questions or comments sure. from our listeners, I want to raise um, the other side of, of the budget. We have spoken a lot about the need for adjustment, um, our economic challenges, but when you presented the estimates in the House of Assembly, there were some um, positives. It was not all doom and gloom mm. and the need to adjust and the need to change. You spoke about um, realizing some of, of the promises that you had made as it relates to greater assistance to um, individuals who are disabled in one way or the other. Right. Mm -hmm. You also spoke to other initiatives. You indicated that despite the difficult situation, that the government is committed to ensuring that some of our social programs continue. Correct. Um, and that there was still, di we saw a significant cut in capital expenditure, mm -hmm. but we have also committed to engaging in some programs that are essential to the development of our communities under the CDP and to better the lives of our of our people as well. So I just want to give you an opportunity to speak to um, moving forward some of the areas that the government of St. Lucia will continue to concentrate on because you believe that it is vital to ensuring mm -hmm. that um, we can have a better a better life in St. Lucia. Absolutely. Um, just let me just take the opportunity to inform parents who have children going to secondary schools that we intend to provide them with a $500 grant as we did last year so that they can meet their basic, basic expenses. We're going to continue the laptop program, um, which we started, and uh, there might be good news that we'll expand it a little bit to include another form in the secondary school system. In this period, I'm very anxious that we continue to fund the social programs of the government. This is a period of difficulty. It is a period of challenge. It's a period of hardship for some. So the government will continue to fund hope. It will continue to fund smiles. It's going to continue the, um, the youth employment program, youth in agriculture program. So there'll be a heavy emphasis on programs to deal with issues of poverty, and programs to bring um, some social amelioration to persons who are vulnerable. In other words, the poor and the vulnerable will have an opportunity to continue to receive support and assistance from the government of, of St. Lucia. So those things are not going to go away. We will have to make one or two adjustments. For example, I think you must have heard the debate um, on the last occasion we met and there was a plea for a more targeted approach to um, subsidies. That you know we provide subsidies. Um, initially it used to be for, for sugar, for rice, um, and, flour. and flour. We reduced those subsidies somewhat. Um, we removed the subsidy on, on white, sugar. Um, white sugar, granulated sugar. Um, and so these are the kinds of suggestions that have emerged that we have to that we have to look at. So in this period of, of a seeming adjustment, very clearly we want to hold on to these programs to make sure that people continue to benefit from those programs. We have just about five more minutes left. We'll open the phone lines for 5239599. I'm sure we have many persons anxious to get their voice in. So you can call in with your questions at this time for 5239599, or you can send your email to live at rslonline.com. Good afternoon, caller. You're on the air. Hey, good afternoon, Jedia. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Prime Minister Kenya Anthony. Good afternoon, sir. Apparently, that's where I could meet up with you. <laughs> <laughs> Frank, I'm not going to tell where else I can meet up with you or where else we meet. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just say this, Prime Minister. I was, I'm, I'm feeling so thrilled that a recommendation I made on my Facebook page, and I did tag it to you, they to make it compulsory that children in school should learn another language outside of English to enhance the That is sector. true, Frank. I remember you told me so. And I'm so happy yeah. that I heard it in the phone speech. And when I heard it, yes. I felt so good. I said, well... So, Frank, I do listen after all. <laughs> well, that, well, you made me... Today, I believe that you're listening. <laughs> <laughs> No, Frank, I always listen. You may, you may not get an immediate response from me, but I do take comments and recommendations from but, citizens yeah, seriously. But I, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really feeling thrilled that it, it, it made the front speech. Okay. And I believe that that is where we 
should go because I did a little research on Aruba. And, and that is one of the things I said. Aruba has one of the highest growth in tourism. But yet still, they don't have the kind of scenery that we have. It's because tourists feel comfortable to go to Aruba. Right. They'll get somebody speaking Parliamento, Spanish, English, any kind of language you you you, you speak. People in, in, in Aruba will be able to speak that. And yeah. tourists feel comfortable with that. And I'm happy to hear that it's going to happen on this side. And you're absolutely correct, Frank, because, look, we are now going to Latin America to see if we can develop a a market for tourists in Latin America, mainly um, Brazil, Argentina, and so on. And it makes no sense to attract um, Latin American visitors Tourist. to St. Lucia and if we can't deal don't. with them inside of hotels, Very which well. has to now, be language. Yeah. The so, other thing I want to say to you, sure. the ticket is a big issue here. For example, I know of persons that are doing programs sponsored by the government, and, and, and come next year, when the salary will be something like 80% or 85%, which they have budgeted, and that will bring them, like, to nothing, those who have loans. I'm suggesting that the government should, instead of a, a, a cut on everybody, they should do a cut from 19 to 21, grade 19 to 21. Also, there are ways and means, I believe, that the government could make money because people like cars, they like to have their own thing. Prime Minister, it is time that we put we put paid parking in the downtown area, so people they're quicker to pay that than to pay taxes. You know, these are some of the suggestions I have. Mm. And places like Sufra, which is a town by itself that makes its own money, I believe it's time that Sufra itself and get less government uh, mainstream money. Okay, All of Frank. Things we could cut and things. Thank you, Thank Frank. You so much now, um, Frank suggested that all you should do is a cut at the grades 19 to 21. And part of the reason why Frank is suggesting that because the last, last government gave, I think, um, 90 grades 19 to 21 fairly hefty increases. But yes. what I think Frank has forgotten is that you have a gap of 75 million to close, that you have to raise about 75 million. And yes. cutting salaries at grades 19 to 21 is really yes. going to be a drop in the bucket in the final analysis. You're not going to um, earn as, you're not going to raise as much as you need to raise. Um, although, of course, uh, one or two of the unions that I spoke with last week suggested possibly using a bifurcated approach, meaning that there's a, if you're going to reduce wages, that you have a higher reduction at the upper end and a lower reduction um, at the lower end of the of the scale. So all of these discussions are in the mix at the moment. Yes, and it would mean that we there need to be a greater analysis as to the impact if we cut at whatever now, percentage of the top, how much? We, just before we go on, I, I raised a point earlier that I need to, I think I need to bring across to our callers. Sure. The, the matter of retrenchment, because some people have said, well, why don't you retrench? Why, why don't you retrench workers? Yes. As I said, I don't believe in retrenchment. I don't think it's the way to go, and we need to avoid that as much as possible. Well, there are possible. some who believed in it who do not believe in it now, so I understand yeah. why now, they do not Now, um, there is something else you need to bear in mind. The situation in Barbados is a little unique. You notice the Barbadian government went by way of retrenchment. Yes. Two reasons. The first is, the situation in Barbados was so bad, the fiscal deficit was so high, that they needed immediate and dramatic action to deal with it. And terminating 3,000 people gave them an immediate um, relief. The impact was fairly dramatic. But there's another more powerful reason. It has to do with something that occurred in Barbados several years ago. Many, many years ago, when Erskine Sandifel was in office, the way wages were reduced by law in Barbados by, I can't remember whether it's 7 or 8%. And remember, there were the usual demonstrations and, and so on. Um, the matter ended up in the courts. And the Privy Council held that um, civil servants had no right to a minimum salary, much less a maximum salary. And that um, when par Parliament was empowered to make laws for the good, good and peace and welfare of the society, and therefore, um, to that extent, Parliament had the authority to reduce salaries. Enter um, Prime Minister Owen Arthur, who decided that never again must you reduce salaries in Barbados. And what they did was to amend the Barbadian Constitution to prevent a reduction in salaries. So the new government found its hands tied. It couldn't go by way of reducing salaries. It had to go by way of retrenchment because it 
the reduction of salaries were disallowed in Barbados under the Barbadian Constitution. Also, I think just for the purpose of our last caller too, um, I just want to refer him to the YouTube document because it gives an analysis of the impact of wage adjustments to so this right, 10%, right. 7%, and 5%. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. I'm just seeing there that it will still not take us where we need to be no, in terms no. even, of the full I mean, 75 million. Even if you had to reduce wages by 10%, it ain't going to get you there. 7% yes. will not get you there. Yes. So the reality is that even if there you, has to be more than even one. if you reduce wages, say by 5%, you will have to resolve to other measures to deal with the situation. We have another caller on the line. Good afternoon, you on the air? Hello, good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, Mr. Prime Minister, can you explain to us in the South, particular thinking, what you and your government were thinking when you decided to replace the subsidy on rice, sugar, and flour and neglected to make allowances for the wholesalers and pretty much crippled the South for weeks on end? Um, so much so that there are still wholesalers who are still really from the effects of, of not having or not being able to procure flour, sugar, and rice for the customers, both on the retail end and uh, for um, the bakers and the poor people of the South. Mm-hmm. So much so that some, some um, businesses had to send staff home or rotate staff. Can you explain to us what the thinking was behind that? Right. Thank you so much, caller. <laughs> Thank you, caller, for that. Um, the caller has raised an issue that was unintended. I don't mm-hmm. think when the policy measures were being implemented, and, and I think one has to be very honest, that that consequence in the South was anticipated. But I think to the credit of the then minister, she attempted to, and of course, as who is still a minister, Emma Hibbert, she attempted to deal with the situation and to deal with the problem. Now, this is the first time I'm hearing that the problem still exists, so I think the caller is suggesting that the problem still exists. Uh, yeah, so, from what I gathered. So maybe this is something that I would need to take up personally to ensure that we deal with it. Sure. Do we, we have another call. Good sure. afternoon, you on the air? Yeah, good afternoon to you, um, uh, Mr. Prime Minister. Hi, good afternoon, sir. Yeah, and the lady hosting the program. Good afternoon. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, it, it has been a, a compulsory expression, you know, for our people to be creative. But creativity doesn't come with recognition, you know? You know, there's only one set of people in this country who are being recognized in what uh, in whatever they are doing when it comes to productivity at large, you know? You see, the department of, of this creative industry are not vigilant in terms of coming together and decentralizing a committee all over the country to create opportunities for people when there is events like the Jazz Festival, everybody, I noticed, has been running across on sidewalks to sell their the, the goods or their produce to, to the visitors when they're passing by. You know? There should be like a, a collaborative effort mm. to bring the artists under one roof in places like, in places like Sufre. Because Sufre is, is a scenic part of St. Lucia, and it has a lot to offer. There is no artist... No painters selling anything, you know. This is very ridiculous. And on the other hand, Mr. Prime Minister, our youth has become very rebellious. And, and we need to provide them with skills and talent to bring the unemployment level down. Likewise, that is one of the reasons why they have become rebellious by calling people Batman and all kinds of names in the country because they have nothing to do. In this country, this is where we need to take the bull by the horn. If it is the Prime Minister. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Creative that, Industries yeah, and that, that, that caller's point resonates um, yeah. quite a lot. Um, I'll be the first to tell you that I wish um, we had made more progress on the Creative portfolio, creative Industries portfolio of the government. Um, and he's, he's right that far greater work can be done to bring artists together. And this is something I constantly complain about, I think, to all my ministers, and they know full well, that we are allowing a huge gap to develop between what is done in the north and what is done in the south. And south, I mean, not just from some Sufre right across yeah, Miku to Denry, yeah. that a more deliberate and calculated effort must be made to bring artists in those communities together. Because say what you want, there, there is a certain amount of authenticity about remaining cultural activities down in the south. They are very rare. Um, I'm not trying to suggest that you don't have authenticity elsewhere, but a lot of, of what we know as um, culture when you were growing up, you still have powerful residues in the South. 
of, of the island. And that's a challenge, that's an issue that um, I think is important. He also raised uh, the, the the situation with young people, the, the boredom, the unemployment. Yes. Um, I think there are a lot of things we can do with the creative industry sector. Yes, good afternoon. I want to make a, a contribution, please. Sure, go ahead. Um, good afternoon, Prime Minister. Hey, good afternoon, sir. Yeah. Um, the contribution I would like to make, I'm hearing, um, although I've been hearing it's a proposal, which I would like to make a suggestion. I do not know what you have come to your decision of the 5% I'm hearing all about. No, there's, there's no decision on any 5% at this stage. Okay. Um, I would want to, I've been speaking to my friends on the, on the ground, and then some of them have been suggesting, like, if there's a 5% to be um, touched, I was talking about we as workers are supposed to um, understand the situation in the economy. Mm -hmm. um, we was come to the point of um, suggesting that the prime minister should should um, take five percent from people who receive, let's say, um, five, four to five thousand dollars a month. I suppose if you do that, maybe that might be able to help the situation. I do not know; it's only a suggestion, so I do not know how what. The union and everybody will think about it. Thank you so very much. Thank you very much for that. Um, Prime Minister, I think it is consistent with a suggestion that you received earlier yes. that there should not be um, one rate across the board yeah. that the government um, should explore. Of course, it's, I know it's always a tempting point of view. And I think what the caller is trying to say is to protect the low end, the as, low end. as much as possible. But you know, it's going to be vital that um, we do not... Um, Call only uh, call upon only a section of the population to make sacrifices. It's important that's understood that all of us have to make sacrifices, no matter who we are and what positions we hold. I mean, I accept the point that there are some people who are better able to make sacrifices than others. But the main problem with that suggestion is that if you were to let us say put a seven percent or eight percent or five percent or four percent. Um, cut in salaries on persons earning 4000 5000 the yield will be too little to deal with our situation. We are going to have a fiscal deficit about $213 million this year. And the target was to try to reduce the fiscal deficit itself by some $75 million reduction in expenditure. That's, that's, and that is a tall, tall order. Prime Minister, we, just before I give you an opportunity for your closing remarks as we come to an end, I think there is one very important question that I want to ask sure. you, and that is the cost of doing nothing. Um, if we do nothing, if we do not um, seek to address this situation immediately and to reduce our expenditure, what would be the cost to the country, at least in the short term? J.D., I don't even want to think of that. Um, and you are correct, absolutely correct, to ask that question. If we do nothing, our deficit will remain high. It will get even higher than the 5.8 percent. In other words, whatever progress we made this past year will disappear. If we do nothing, it will even become even more serious for us. Banks, institutions are not going to lend us because they will feel that their loans would be in jeopardy. They would feel that they are dealing with a government that is not serious about dealing with its problems, and uh, they will feel that they are dealing with a population that refuses to, to understand that this is an environment in which sacrifices are required, and they're not going to risk lending, lending their money. That's, that, that is the reality of the of the situation that, that we face. It means also that we're not going to finance our own development. If, of course, you're not going to generate a surplus, or if, of course, you're not going to um, be able to raise money for your capital development, then no one, is going to want, no one will want to invest in you, and the things we need to do to finance our development um, will, will not occur. So that's a kind of situation that you have. And then the specter of what has happened in other countries is beginning to happen to St. Lucia. That this government is going to be struggling every month to find money to pay salaries. And uh, that the specter of repeated delays in salaries, etc., that has happened in other countries will begin to happen to us and um, go to the very heart of our credibility. 
the fact of the matter is that we have to learn from the experience of others. I mean, look at what has happened to Antigua, look at what has happened to St. Kitts. But the good news is that if you can deal with your problems, you can resolve them. I mean, look at St. Kitts today. St. Kitts today um, has turned the corner. Just imagine they provided us with a million dollars to deal with um, the damage suffered as a result of the Christmas trough. This is almost unheard of, little St. Kitts. Yes. What has really saved St. Kitts, though, and in fairness to um, to that country and commentators is this, that they have had this um, investment program, this in, um, citizenship by investment program, and they have earned millions of dollars that they're now able to plow back into the economy. And I think more than anything else that has helped them to deal with their own fiscal deficit. But St. Kitts still has a huge problem. St. Kitts' debt-to-GDP ratio is exceedingly high, Very. although they have been able to reduce it substantially from the high point of 167% downwards, I think, below to one, below 120%. Um, but nevertheless, the internal pressures that they had have dealt with it. Dominica has had to implement a program. They had to, in their case, reduce um, wages and I think introduce new taxation. They dealt with it now. They're leaner and that they are stronger. Our time has arrived because of the decisions that we have taken in the past. And uh, um, I just want to say to everybody that, look, I, I really know this is not going to be easy. And if there's any person who's going to take the brunt of it, it's, it's really me, both as Prime Minister and Minister of Finance. But I think I love this country too much to see it um, disappear. And um, I think we have done so well in the past. We can do well again. And this is not the first time we have faced difficulty. We have had it in the past. We have had a courage to deal with it. And we have to deal with it um, this time. I mean, when I think of history and what will come out of this, I know right now I'm not <laughs> necessarily going to be the most popular person um, in the minds of everybody. But look, this is a pain that I, <laughs> I reconcile myself to accepting. But I just hope that maybe when it's somewhere into the future, when I decide the time has come for me to say goodbye to politics, that people can look back and say that I did the right thing. I, will, I just want to know and believe that I am doing the right thing, and I believe I am. Thank you so much, Prime Minister. I think you've given us a very good summary as to what to expect. And um, I, it's a pity we didn't get to discuss some of the other matters, but we did indicate it to our listeners that we wanted to focus on the economy this afternoon. I want to thank you, Prime Minister, for being here this afternoon. I know that you have a very busy schedule ahead of you this week. Yes. Um, a lot to do, and I think I've borrowed into some time of another engagement that you have. But I want to thank our listeners. I want to thank our callers, just to let you know that this program will be available on our YouTube channel sometime later on today. So you could search for Press Secretary to the Prime Minister St. Lucia on YouTube. It will be there. It will also be on our Facebook page. And so you could let somebody know. If you miss the program, you get an opportunity to listen to it. You get an opportunity to analyze the information presented. And we always welcome feedback from you. This is all our time for Inside Government this afternoon. I want to thank you. I want to thank the management of RSL for allowing us the extra time. Prime Minister, it is quarter past Whoa. two, past three. Our program usually ends at 3 p.m. So I want to thank the man at the technical control as well for putting our calls through and being very kind with us this afternoon and patient. We'll be back here next week with another edition of Inside Government and thereafter... More the economy. Yes, more on the economy. It's just started. Just started. And thereafter, um, on Tuesday at 5 p.m., the Prime Minister will be presenting his very much anticipated budget statement. Right. So you could tune into RSL for that because it will be live on air as well. I'll tell you something though, JD, just in closing. It's amazing the sophistication in the society. Solutions have really matured, they've grown up. Um, and I'm not berating anybody or talking down to anybody. You know what it impresses me? The way the country has um, come to terms with economic issues. Yes. There's this fascinating debate, this interesting debate. Deficit is now a, um, a household is now a, language. Uh, yes. Yes. And there's a new there's a new lexicon that we're now beginning beginning to bring the economy close to our lives to yes. have a better sense of it. Yes. Um, and I think this is good for the country. Very really, good. very, very good for the country. That it shows that we are thinking about the country. People are not just thinking about themselves. And that we are futuristic Despite their too. pain, but they are thinking about this country, where this country is going. Yes. And despite everything else, these are positives. Indeed. Thank you again, Prime Minister. Good afternoon. We'll be back here next week, Tuesday, for another edition of Inside Government. Thank you.